thanks, uh, Katarina, and uh, thanks to Publique for the invitation to come and speak, and thank you all for coming. Uh, <clears throat> so, um, I thought I would talk uh, about the film that was screened today, um, Enjoy Poverty by Renzo Martins, uh, which um, I want to situate within my current um, research project, which is uh, uh, the second book that, that Katerina mentioned, um, which is called Return to the Post-Colony Specters of Colonialism and Contemporary Art. And th this is a book project that I'm uh, working on now, and it should be finished, uh, it should be finished um, early spring next year, and then um, uh, hopefully it will, will uh, come out in the, in the autumn of 2012 by Sternberg Press. Um, and it's a, it's a book that, <clears throat> that um, looks at uh, really five case studies, um, all dealing with artists, um, mostly from Europe, um, one South African artist, all of whom are, are, um, are, are going to uh, areas of sub-Saharan Africa to investigate political um, and economic conditions there. Uh, and, and so I, I situate this in, the, in a larger framework of um, the politics of globalization. How, how in other words, are, are, how can we define globalization, first of all? How can we contest the, the kinds of political and economic forms of, uh, of inequality that are, are occurring today? Um, how, how can we define the, the situation of, uh, of what some, like uh, uh, Ashil Mbembe, who's an interesting theorist, um, what some are, are calling the post-colony. So um, the, the, <coughs> the, the, the book will begin with the question, why have contemporary artists of the last decade begun to address the specters of colonialism? Um, and I, one reason certainly is that um, the artists that I'm dealing with uh, which are uh, Sven Augustinen, he's the, um, a Belgian artist uh, who's recently done a film called Spectres, which deals with, investigates the conditions of, um, of, uh, of, uh, of the, the memory of Belgium's colonial intervention in the Congo in the early 60s, when, um, when the first independent prime minister, Patrice Lumumba, uh, came to power and was um, soon arrested and assassinated with uh, alleged Belgian complicity. So this film is, 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 was recently made and uh, first exhibited a, uh, this last summer actually at Wheels in, in Brussels. Um, another artist that will be in the book is Vincent Mason, who's a, um, also a Belgian artist, who has investigated the, the history of, um, of France's relationship to Côte d'Ivoire, to the, to the colony of Côte d'Ivoire, and specifically uh, this, this image you may know from, uh, from Roland Barthes' book, Mythologies, of the young boy, who's the young black boy who's saluting the, the French flag. Um, and Vincent went to uh, present-day Burkina Faso to investigate the, the, um, the post-history of that image and to try to find the, the, the boy who would now be an older man um, who appeared in that image and to investigate also uh, Bart's own relationship and his, the relationship of his family to colonialism. Um, and then uh, there's Renzo Martins, and I'll talk about that more specifically in a few minutes. Um, another artist is Zarina Bimji. Um, that I'm, she's a, a London-based filmmaker that has done some interesting work in relationship to her relationship to Uganda. Uh, Zarina has an Asian African background, and her family came to Uganda in the early uh, 20th century, um, and lived there for several generations uh, until uh, the, uh, the general Idi Amin came to power um, in the 60s, and uh, in 1972 decided to, to expel all Asians from Uganda. Uh, so her family was part of that uh, expulsion of Asian Ugandans, and she's done some uh, interesting films about this. And, including a, um, a new film that she's premiering uh, at her upcoming retrospective um, at the Whitechapel in London, which will um, come up in uh, January, I think, next January. Uh, and then I'm also including one South African artist, Peter Hugo, who's a documentary photographer, or at least a photographer who deals with, uh, engages with documentary practice in his work. Uh, 
as he goes to different um, places, for example, in, uh, in Ghana and, and investigates the conditions of, um, of uh, e-waste uh, dump sites. So there's, a, there's also an ecological interest in the book in terms of how, um, how whereas once uh, um, developed nations like Europe would go to Africa, uh, as they still do, for, you know, to, to exploit resource uh, extraction within uh, different places like the Congo. Um, there's also another element of this, which is that um, um, increasingly uh, uh, um, electronic waste is shipped from Europe to Africa to these supposed uh, uh, recycling sites, which are, uh, um, as you might suspect, not really exactly recycling. It's more of a, a kind of... Uh, a very toxic uh, way of dealing with um, e-waste in in, uh, in places like Ghana that, that is symptomatic of this larger structure of inequality between Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, <clears throat> so, so as such, these these projects respond to the imperatives of the present, uh, particularly the claims of of they respond very critically to the claims of globalization, that globalization is, we, as we hear again and again, is about freedom and justice and inclusivity. Uh, when, when we look at it, in, in fact, when we look at it critically, it's, it's um, exactly not about these things. It's about producing unfreedom or injustice and inequality and exclusivity. Um, so one, one interesting part of this is that um, these artists that I'm looking at are part of a generation that were you know, they were mostly born in the 60s, so right, right about the time when the majority of African nations were gaining their independence. Around 1960, about 17 African nations gained their independence. Um, and it's re recently, uh, last year was the 50th anniversary of, of many uh, African nations um, that, gained, that gained their independence, like, uh, like, Cong like the Congo. So it's interesting that, that this generation of artists are, are returning, in a way, it's a kind of almost uh, a reverse migration, not, not that they're moving to, um, to sub-Saharan Africa, but they're returning to investigate the causes of the kinds of inequality um, and uh, economic um, destitution and poverty that, have, that has inspired so many people from those areas to attempt to migrate to Europe, to, to come to the advanced world. So I think, in that sense, it's a very important um, development of artists who are returning, who are um, seeking out um, the, uh, the, the, the circumstances which compel people to want to come to Europe. So it's, it, it's, it's, in that sense, it's, I think it's a very important um, uh, investigation that these artists are, are taking on. Um, <clears throat> okay, so with that said, I'd like to now move on to talk about this film um, and, and uh, to place it in context, talk about the politics that, that, um, that um, the, the film engages with and also um, make some comparisons to the, some other works of art that I think help to bring out the, 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 the interesting aspects of the film and also some of the problems. Um, <clears throat> And I wrote a short text about this, and I'm, I'm going to go over the text and, and maybe um, uh, think out loud about some, some of the points that, that I make in this, in this text. So it should be, I don't know, about uh, 30 or 45 minutes, and then we can have a conversation. <coughs> um, so <clears throat> uh, reflecting on the unprecedented flow of contemporary art throughout the world today, as it trailblazes new networks and energizes different local contexts. Um, Gerardo Mascara, who's a, a curator and a writer, he notes optimistically that globalization has certainly improved communications to an extraordinary extent, just as it has dynamized and pluralized cultural circulation while providing a more pluralistic consciousness. So he has a very positive understanding of globalization. And he may be partly correct, even as he goes on to point out the dark side of uh, globalization, including the, 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 the reactions to it, including the developments of nationalism and xenophobia uh, and right-wing uh, right forms of uh, racism that we're all familiar with, I think, today. Um, still, uh, Renzo Martin's film, Enjoy, uh, Episode 3, Enjoy Poverty, 
And we have a still from his film here, which is set in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, uh, in the DRC, provides, a, I think, a, a devastating alternative understanding of the brutal nature of north-south relations, of inequality and the exploitative image economy that stubbornly uh, goes along with it. Despite all its risks, um, and I think there are many risks to this film, it's very, um, it's very provocative and even problematic, I think, in some ways. Some of the risks include um, producing uh, stereotypes of Africans as helpless victims. This is another uh, still from the film. Or reducing Congolese people to neo-colonized neo uh, servants. Or reproducing a, a pornography of poverty. Um, still, episode three bears important lessons, I think. Um, and it, it, I think it, it's, it's, at least I would argue that it's worthwhile to consider the film seriously and, and to engage with some of the issues that it opens up. Um, uh, among these issues, uh, it provides a reality check for optimistic globalists and a lethal glow to the ambitions of concerned documentarians, especially those that seek to ameliorate suffering by representing abjection in developing countries. So this is one of the, I think, the targets of the film, is to, 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 uh, to criticize the history of documentary approaches to poverty, um, to, to the often well-intentioned desire of uh, of journalists as well as artists to show poverty and to raise awareness, to raise critical awareness and to, to thereby attempt to, to, to make things better, to make the world more livable. Um, so the scandal that is the film, and I'll talk more about that in a second, uh, puts us uh, squarely before the fault lines of globalization's many crises today, including the disastrous fallout from neoliberal structural adjustment policies implemented in the Global South, and in Africa in particular, um, as well the failures of humanitarian practice and its compromised ethical discourse, and the paradoxes of a politically engaged photojournalism and contemporary art. Uh, consider the European photojournalists operating in the DRC um, who are featured in Martin's film. So, as you know, in, in the film, uh, Renzo often is focusing not so much on the images of, uh, of violence or poverty, but rather on the image makers of, of you know, those scenes, the, the commercial photojournalists, and also the documentary artists who are there. Um, so the film un uncovers how uh, such famine photography flows into a global image industry running on poverty as fuel unleashing a vicious cycle of profit, objectification, and sympathy that perpetuates cliches of Africans as helpless victims mired in misery, uh, reducing spectators to depoliticized charitable donors. It's of course a long story, going back to the food shortages in uh, Biafra uh, during the 1968 Nigerian Civil War, when journalists first produced horrific images of starving children meant to encourage relief aid. So this, these are some images of uh, the, the civil war in Biafra, Nigeria, in 68. So this is really the first time in 1968 um, when documentarians went to a sub-Saharan African country to produce documentary images to try to encourage uh, a charity and philanthropy. To try, you know, this, is, this was the beginning of what we're now quite familiar with. Um, so a similar cycle beleaguers the international humanitarian industry today which for critics like Renzo Martins uh, risks exacerbating conflicts more than mitigating their negative effects, in large part because NGOs, non-governmental organizations, uh, not only service emergency victims, but also depend, they come to depend on emergency victims for, for, their, for the perpetuation of their own inst institutions. Uh, and importantly, they depend on sensationalized images to generate the funding streams that guarantee their continued existence. And there's, there's a lot of literature on this that has recently criticized humanitarian, uh, the humanitarian industry, uh, which is quite interesting to read. But there are people, there are many critics who argue that humanitarian organizations do more damage than they do good, uh, which is very, that's interesting to consider. Um, 
but for example, in Sierra Leone recently, uh, when they were you know, chopping off the arms of people, um, chopping off the hands, much of that violence was done specifically to uh, encourage uh, documentarians to, to capture those images, to then, to then bring in um, uh, uh, like World Bank funding, right, relief aid. Um, so it's, a, it's part of a whole manipulative uh, violence cycle um, that uh, humanitarianism sometimes plays into despite its uh, intentions. So in this regard, the DRC is, is only one flashpoint for uh, many such zones of conflict. Think of Afghanistan or Iraq or Haiti recently with, with the earthquake uh, and the Sudan uh, presently, where we encounter an increasingly common logic of intervention that joins military response and humanitarian aid. Uh, in the context of defunded public institutions and eroding national infrastructure, uh, intertwining the ethical imperatives and political justifications and challenging ruling concepts of legitimacy and legality. So a, larger, a large part of this is the, the, the result of the structural adjustment policies that occurred that were implemented largely in the 1980s and 90s in Africa that basically ended up defunding states and um, making it so that they couldn't provide uh, aid and infrastructure development and uh, health care and education for their own citizens, right? So it's the production of the NGO industry, which is part of a, a, a more complex history. Um, as the social scientist Craig Calhoun points out, uh, humanitarianism flourishes as an ethical response to emergencies, not just because bad things happen in the world, but because many people have lost faith in both economic development and political struggle. Um, as ways of trying to improve the human lot. So this is part of a, uh, an argument that we've moved from a political state of affairs where we would address crises through um, a political environment to a new s condition today which is turning to the ethical. So that this is exemplified in, in, by NGOs and humanitarian organizations that often operate uh, in the guise of political neutrality, right? That's very important for NGOs and humanitarian organizations, that they're politically neutral. Um, uh, they're ethically concerned, but politically neutral. And that allows them to engage with different communities and not um, be ensnared within political uh, conflicts. Of course, they end up being ensnared in political conflicts, which is part of the problem. So this ethical response opens on to wider quandaries of humanitarianism, including its lack of accountability, its self-perpetuating institutions that prioritize highly visible and mediatized conflicts over non-sensationalized areas of devastation, and its self-declared political and neutrality that often inadvertently, inadvertently um, serves the interests of those in power, rather than helping victims in need, which are exactly the problems that episode three, Enjoy Poverty, reveals in the DRC that we learn that, that, um, that the humanitarian organizations that are operating in the Congo uh, um, follow the areas where there's been a lot of image production, where there's a, a, a sense of visibility within the international media. And if there is no uh, visibility in relationship, to, in, into the, in relationship to the international media, then those areas don't receive aid. This is part of, this is part of what's going on. Uh, not, not unexpectedly, Martins fails in his central uh, goal, in, at least in the film, the scenario that he sets up, uh, which is to train Congolese photographers to financially benefit from images of starvation and malnutrition and violence, which are otherwise these, this, these, this practice of documenting uh, those, um, those forms of poverty are otherwise monopolized by European photojournalists who have exclusive access to the global media commissions. Um, so here you see a still from the film where, where you see some of the uh, Congolese photographers who <coughs> Renzo Martins has trained taking images of a starving child in the hospital, right? Um, so that instead of photographing parties and marriages and wedding ceremonies, things like that, Martins suggests that they can earn much more money by, by photographing poverty. Um, and uh, ultimately, that 
that goal of, um, of benefiting from their country's greatest resource, poverty, ultimately that fails, right? Because they're still unable to sell their images to uh, the, the media uh, industries um, for various reasons. Um, so Renzo's solution or proposed solution to, to Congolese poverty ultimately is a, it's a failed um, endeavor. So in, in that sense, the film is based on this, this failure that he performs. It turns out that the Congolese cannot enjoy poverty in any other way than to submit to its irrevocable reality, um, which is a conclusion that I think we should all reject, obviously, which points to the, an interesting politicizing element of the film, that, that, um, that it invites us to, to uh, disagree with its conclusions, basically. It's, it's a film that, that begs us to disagree with it, I think. So that, that's interesting um, as, a, as an artistic strategy. Nevertheless, we should take seriously Martin's provocation, which, which he voices at a meeting of the World Bank, uh, sh which is shown in the film. I'll show you a clip in a second. That uh, He suggests at this meeting of the World Bank in Kinshasa uh, that poverty is the Congo's greatest resource, uh, for which it receives huge sums of humanitarian aid. And in doing so, his film implicates a range of international actors including multinational organizations carrying out resource extraction in the DRC, global financial institutions encouraging free trade over social welfare, uh, self-promoting humanitarian organizations that are cleaning up the civil war damage, and the media industry sensationalizing the whole carnival. All of these players are, are brought in and criticized by, uh, by Renzo's film. Um, so this, this is just a short clip from the film. Vous vous présentez d'abord. Oui, je suis euh, Renzo Martens, hollandais, je fais un film euh, ici au, au Congo. Dans euh, le montant qui a été accordé annuellement, donc c'était 1,8 milliard de dollars, quelque chose comme ça, euh, quelle partie ça représente dans le revenu total du Congo ah, Ça c'est gentil. Euh, quelle, quelle, est, quelle est la partie euh, dans ce... Oui. Ce 1,8 milliard de dollars, quelle est la partie dans le revenu total du Congo Et si euh, c'est un montant, un pourcentage élevé, j'aimerais bien savoir si alors la lutte contre la pauvreté, pour laquelle 1,8 milliard de dollars sont, euh, est alors une ressource naturelle très importante pour le Congo pour l'instant, peut-être le plus important. Euh, euh, D'abord, la pauvreté, ce n'est pas une ressource naturelle. La pauvreté, c'est un défi commun pour euh, la communauté internationale. Il est vrai que l'aide au développement apporte à la RDC plus d'argent que le cuivre, le coton et le diamant, même ensemble. Mais c'est normal, parce que c'est comme ça que se développe euh, une situation. Okay, so he, he goes on to address this a little bit more. <coughs> But I think the, the... The, the point here that, that, is, that, that comes out is, I think, um, quite devastating in terms of the, um, the glimpse that we have into the inter international financial arrangements that, that produce it. Renzo's point is that the, the development aid um, produces poverty in the country by, by creating a context of debt that Congo becomes beholden to. Um, and so, um, This, is, this goes back, this, this brings up a whole history of the West's relationship to the Congo and many, many African states, which is based on this production uh, of financial debt that then um, uh, creates a, a, a relation of, uh, of political servitude um, on behalf of African nations to European uh, and international uh, funding bodies. So this is, this is the way in which uh, neoliberalism um, reproduces itself, um, and it's 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 quite complex, obviously. And it, I, I find that it's very difficult to to uh, to come across um, artistic engagements that actually deal with this um, finance, these kind of global financial arrangements. And I think that that is an, a, an, a very important part of this film. And it's quite unusual, as I said, to 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 be able to engage with this in relationship to to 
in relationship to artistic practice, but it's something that I think we all need to engage with more, these kind of financial arrangements, these kind of um, larger neoliberal structural economic um, uh, uh, relationships between the West and, and the global South. So for me, this is, this, this is an important element of, of the film. Um, so <clears throat> instead of a more equitable and inclusive new world order, the present state of things, at least according to episode three, equals more or less what the um, International Forum on Globalization calls global economic apartheid. And I just show you the cover of this book because I think it's a very interesting approach to um, the economics of neoliberal globalization. And it, it, it's, it's quite readable and uh, useful on a, on a um, more practical and act, even on an activist uh, uh, level. So according to this counter-narrative presented in a book like this, worldwide environmental devastation unfolds amidst endless brutal wars over precious resources, while a widespread and growing democratic deficit rules as multinational corporations disregard national sovereignty and their seemingly useless mechanisms of legal and economic accountability. So the result is what could be called disaster capitalism, to use a term by the, the, uh, the writer Naomi Klein. Uh, disaster capitalism keeps countries in the global south locked in the position of neocolonialism via debt servitude, providing fodder for the media industry that continues to feed off the spectacle, haunting European viewers who conveniently misrecognize the dreadful outcome of their government's policies as if it were an accident of nature. Um, such as the world Martin's encounters in the DRC. In another of the film's parables, the artist visits a, pho a photography exhibition in Kinshasa, uh, showing black and white shots of toiling Congolese laborers, images that are sub subsequently purchased for their aesthetic value uh, by one white plantation owner. So this is an interesting case where you see the site. You see the very cycle of uh, documentary images. That um, the images that are taken that you might relate to a history of social documentary practice, right? To try to expose the poverty of the working class. You see those exact images being bought by the plantation owner uh, and appreciated for their artistic value. Um, so this is very interesting. Again, this is the this is the a main target for Renzo Martins, and I think it's a very interesting one. Um, that is to show how often uh, um, well-meaning documentary practitioners end up contributing to a cycle of, um, of the, the production of images around poverty that are then com uh, commodified. Uh, and then, you know, work against their own interests. More than a matter of local scandal, the scene dramatizes a widespread dilemma of contemporary art, that of presenting the, the politics of aesthetics in contexts that paradoxically perpetuate an exploitative distribution of the sensible. Those are, to use the words of Jacques Ranciere. Um, so the, the, the context is one of sheer consumerism, of voyeuristic enjoyment, of a false sympathetic proximity to the victimized that grants spectators distance from complicity in the wider situation of generalized economic inequality. The problem is not uh, new. In fact, it identifies art's difficult and long-standing location in a paradox which I think is, is endemic to liberalism, according to which art offers simultaneously two things. On, on the one hand, it offers a, social, a, a social-cultural progressivism supportive of human rights and individual freedoms and equality in principle, uh, concerned and, and cons offers concerned expressions of political sympathy with the oppressed. So that's on the one hand. And then on the other hand, it, it produces a tacit acceptance, or at least the absence of a critique, of the wider economic system that perpetuates the very same social unfreedoms and global divisions against which the first, the, the freedom and equality is posed. So it's a paradox which has only grown more blatant in recent years. And it's this same context that we can locate the humanitarianism that has exploded since 1989, thanks to the end of the ideological conflicts um, of the Cold War, uh, and uh, which has supplanted the struggle for political agency and economic justice. Um, as Hito Steirl, the artist, the Berlin-based artist, has recently observed in this essay in Eflux, 
the blind, what she calls the blind spot of contemporary political art dedicated to global issues is to overlook the often compromised local conditions of its production and display. Right? A situation often, as she writes, uh, reeking of the exploitation of armies of young female volunteers um, and funded by politically unsavory benefactors such as multinational banks and arms dealers. Right? So that the local context of artistic displays overlooked so that artists can deal with um, far away political problems. So as she writes, we could try to understand art space as a political one instead of trying to represent a politics that is all, always happening elsewhere. I think that she's surely right to point out this negligence, but it's in my view it's a false choice. I think we can and must work on multiple fronts, not just one or the, one or the other. Uh, which is the significance again of uh, Renzo Martin's work. Uh, to, that is to critically locate political images in networks of consumption and distribution that support forms of inequality, uh, putting himself in the midst of those networks and its contradictions and failures. So that um, when he walks around and you know, much of the time he's holding the video camera pointed at his own face, um, this is, I think, a, a very important self-reflexive act, right? He, he's trying to, instead of you know, going along with the conventions of documentary practice of, of <coughs> imaging the destitute and, and those who are starving or um, who are suffering, instead of producing more images of the suffering uh, and producing what some have called a spectacle of misery, right? He instead reverses the camera and to focus on himself. So it's a, it's a self-critical intervention in the role of the image makers in relationship to poverty. And, and that's what is, I think, so important and interesting about this film. Um, it's also important to, to resist the potential reductiveness of, of the critique that Hito Steirol makes. Even, I like her work very much, but I think this one point of hers, I have a, uh, I have a problem with it. Um, so the, the potential reductiveness is that politically conservative contexts and funding bodies and commercial institutions somehow completely determine, as if by necessity, the meaning of art. Or that politically engaging work cannot operate in unanticipated or strategic ways against the very contexts in which they find themselves. Right? Consider a recent comment by um, the Badoon, the, the magazine dedicated to um, the Middle East, uh, Bidoon. So consider a comment the Bidoon editor uh, Nagar Azimi made recently, where she writes this. She says, what is the good of engaged art, whether it take the form of governmental critique or institutional critique or otherwise, when it is subsumed back into the system? Right? This is a common criticism of, um, of critical political art that we hear, that one hears a lot. Uh, but who's to say that such work, no matter where it is presented, um, cannot inspire, nevertheless, a politicization amongst unexpected viewers or contribute to unsuspected alliances with social movements outside the gallery, or even inspire protests and manifestations? The problem with arguments like um, Nagar's, also someone whose views I like very much, uh, otherwise, but the problem with this specific argument is that they, they endow the so-called system with a seemingly omnipotent power of co-optation. Um, the, the problem is that they end up serving that very power by making that criticism, inadvertently licensing reactionary attacks on art's political ambition, as if we should just abandon um, a, the political ambition of artistic practice, which is obviously um, very problematic. Certainly it's an, it's, it's an accomplishment of Martin's art. Uh, uh, by the way, the one interesting book that deals with um, the shifting frames of references when it comes to artistic practice and images. The image regime is Judith Butler's Frames of War. Uh, for, she, she talks about the, the images that came out of Abu Ghraib, right? Th these are images that were, um, you know, they were, they were made in the context of, um, of objectifying people. They were kind of a mechanism of torture themselves, the images uh, of prisoners. Um, yet, those same images eventually lost, the, you know, the, the makers of those images lost control of them and they, in, they entered into different distribution networks. 
that inspired massive protests. So this is a good example of how, of how you can't ultimately control the contexts. Um, even if you might think images are totally controlled, produced in the military, they can always inspire other kinds of um, developments, which is quite interesting. Um, so it makes no sense to say that you know, political art is co-opted, therefore it's useless. This is you know, only the beginning of a larger discussion. Um, so certainly it's the accomplishment, I think, at least of Martin's artwork, that we are having these debates right now. Uh, and would it not represent an act of intellectual um, abandonment, even a defeated conservatism, to, to, to leave the politics of aesthetics to institutions that are only too happy to instrumentalize them? Why not engage a diversity of approaches and assess them individually and critically, but without forcing simplistic choices and posing false alternatives? So in that vein, let's consider another model, uh, another artistic example that critically investigates the relation between globalization's image economy and humanitarian photojournalism. Uh, and that is The Sound of Silence, a piece from 2006 by Alfredo Yar. Uh, the Chilean-born artist has long focused on the documentary images intersection with media and politics. Uh, including subjects such as the conditions of labor and exploitation in the global south. For example, he's looked at gold mining <clears throat> in Amazonia, uh, in Brazil, in his piece called Introduction to a Distant World from 1985. So these are um, gold miners in Brazil. Uh, and Russia's uh, a piece from 1986, where this was part of a billboard that he displayed on uh, in subway stations in New York City that, sh that showed you the price of gold along with images of uh, the miners who are uh, mining gold uh, and you know bringing attention to the obvious division between the, the workers and those who invest and um, speculate uh, on, about gold. Uh, he's also dealt with the corporate media's alternatively spectacularizing and silencing approach to humanitarian emergencies outside the West. For example, in the 1994 genocide in Rwanda. Uh, and he did a piece in 1994 of, um, he looked at all the covers of Newsweek. It's a weekly magazine, an American weekly magazine. And he, so he, he showed every cover um, in the, the year of 1994, and uh, you could see the development, and, and there's text that describe what was happening in Rwanda, uh, you know, the, the, the gradual development of the genocide, uh, the growth of uh, the numbers of people dying, and then showing you what's on the cover of Newsweek. And, you know, not, not surprisingly, it's amazing to see how late Newsweek was to respond to an African tragedy and to see what was going on, you know, what was occupying its attention instead. Um, like the O.J. Simpson scandal uh, was one event that, that Newsweek thought was more important and more newsworthy uh, than the genocide in, in Rwanda, which is incredible. Um, so the sound of silence um, that he did <coughs> uh, uh, more recently in 2006 follows suit by taking up um, an, uh, an, a now infamous photograph by um, Kevin Carter, who's a South African photojournalist, um, who took this picture in 1993 uh, of a starving child in the Sudan. Um, uh, and you see a vulture uh, behind the child. As it appeared in this image by the um, New York Times, um, you see it on the top, right? Um, <clears throat> Sudan is described as trying to uh, placate the West, so it was used in that, that story. Um, so the article was about the country's civil war crisis. Um, the piece presents an eight-minute-long silent film inside a large container. Uh, the spatial arrangement um, offers a carefully controlled viewing experience, beginning with a wall of fluorescent lights placed in, on its exterior, which blind viewers as they enter a dark architectural space, um, followed by um, a green light when they can enter into the, into the uh, building. So Alfredo Yar is very aware of this image. He, he doesn't simply want to show it. He's aware of the, you know, he's very skeptical of even looking at the image. So it's a very choreographed, 
uh, viewing experience that he sets up to try to um, bring about a critical relationship to, to this image, <coughs> to this very disturbing image. So inside, we, you, you come across um, a running text which is presented in a typewriter like font, as you see here, uh, which recounts Carter's life as an um, anti apartheid South African photojournalist and tells about his experiences taking the photograph of, of the um, <coughs> malnourished little Sudanese girl who was appearing on the ground while she was being stalked by a hungry vulture in the background. The photographer waited, as we learned from this tale, the photographer waited 20 minutes um, to capture that image, hoping in vain that the creature would spread its wings um, before he finally clicked the camera shutter and chased the bird away. So according to Yar's account, he then, after he took the image, he sat down under a tree, lit a cigarette, talked to God, and cried. The film projects the ghastly image for an instant on the screen, uh, and then curtailing the viewer's time to act as a voyeur, but also <clears throat> after the strobe lights surprise viewers with a flash of light. So there's this um, continual attempt to blind viewers uh, and to objectify them instead in the act of uh, viewing. Um, and we learn also that no one knows what happened to the child. Just um, uh, uh, some background information. When the, when the photograph appeared in the New York Times, uh, the article didn't, it didn't explain what happened to the girl. And it, it uh, produced a massive response by readers who wanted to know, what, what do you, how can you show this image and not tell us what happened to this girl? And how could the photographer stand by and even take this image, right? It raised all these ethical questions about photojournalism. How could he wait 20 minutes while this girl is starving on the ground, um, right? And this was part of the controversy that the image uh, created. So my question, how does one relate to such an image in the art gallery context? And to Carter's own ethical dilemma, whether to give immediate assistance to the girl in need or cruelly, to withhold that assistance in order to make the most powerful image that he could in the hope of generating international assistance for Sudan's crisis. Right? That would be his, the photojournalist's argument for why one would stand by while you know, suffering is happening before his eyes. So was Carter, as some people pointed out, was Carter not himself another vulture on the scene? Um, and do gallery visitors not become more vultures in turn by even looking at the image. Clearly, Alfredo Yar's work deals with exactly these thorny questions. For Jacques Rancière, who's written about this, this uh, piece, Yar's, Alfredo Yar's work brings about what Rancière calls a different way of looking by creating what Rancière terms a disruption of the normal relationship between textual images and visible forms. The artist constructs spaces where a completely new interweaving of words and forms can give mass death or max, mass exile, its resonance. So the, the solution to the problem of media's spectacle of misery is not to look away, at least for Rancière, but rather to look again, but in a different way. As he says, the accusation of aestheticizing horror is too convenient. It shows too much ignorance of the complex entanglement between the aesthetic intensity of the exceptional situation taken in by the gaze and the ethical or political concern to bear witness to the horror of a reality nobody is bothering to see. So, so this, is, this is interesting because this is a familiar criticism of, of these kind of images, that they aestheticize horror. They create striking, compelling visual images of other people's misery. And Rancière, Rancière argues that this is, this is not a problem. In fact, we need to look more at these images. Um, not to be voyeurs, but to be critical, engaged uh, participants in the construction of meaning and, and interpretation. Um, so I, th I, I would agree that I think this ethical questioning is important, but the problem, I think, for me, is that Rancière doesn't go far enough. It's also urgent, I think, to identify the wider framework in which, in which such images circulate, and to move toward a systemic critique of humanitarianism in the media industry. Images like Carter's reproduce images of famine that motor crises, mostly, uh, most notable when perpetrators stage a spectacle of violence 
uh, four cameras precisely to get aid, as has happened recently in the Sudan and in Sierra Leone and Zaire and Somalia. Um, so once we position ourselves as spectators and accept the ethical terms of the demand made on us to be appalled at the horror or to sympathize and to bear witness, we've already been sucked into the logic of humanitarianism and risk becoming complicit in its larger situation. So in this sense, it's, I think it's significant that the sound of silence points, us, points out as well, following Carter's grief-stricken suicide, the, the photographer killed himself months later after the, uh, this scandal broke. Uh, for this image that he put in the New York Times. Um, it's interesting to note that his surviving daughter came to inherit the image and its rights, uh, which came to be managed by um, the Corbus Photo Agency, which is owned none other than by uh, Bill Gates of Microsoft. And so here you see, this is where the image appears on the, um, the bottom right. And this is the, the image archive of the uh, Corbus images, which own, they own tons of media images. So if you want to reproduce this, you, you would have to pay the, the Corbus uh, industry. And this is part of, again, the, the, the commodification of images of poverty that, that occurs. Um, so I think Alfredo Yard doesn't go far enough. It's, this, is, this is the larger uh, institutional structure of, of the, the flow and commercialization of images of poverty that we need to, to look at. And I think, I think Renzo Martin's film does this um, in a more um, developed way. Um, in a recent panel discussion on uh, what was called poverty pornography, uh, that characterizes so many jur journalistic and artistic documentary approaches to sub-Saharan Africa, um, the theorist Ashil Mbembe He's a um, Cameroonian uh, writer who's very interesting. He questions why such stereotyping and demeaning images continue to circulate and command attention. Right? Why do they? Uh, considering Martin's and Yar's work, um, it becomes clear that what drives the industry is the conjunction of liberal humanitarian concern and neoliberal capitalist incentive. And in, the, in this regard, these projects, I think, are worthy of critical debate. But even while they have um, they importantly expose the financial causes that drive the political economy of poverty porn. Uh, one can hardly disagree with Mbembe's in, important point that the danger still remains of exhausting one's critical energies on such work while overlooking the many local African practices that show uh, positive representations of collective solidarity and political agency posed against the media spectacle of African misery. Right? So I think here we have to, I think this is a really important point. We can't, we can't continue, in other words, as speaking for myself as a writer, as a historian, as a critic, a curator, we can't continue to be focused on um, you know, European criticisms of documentary practice. We have to also look at more you know, local African responses to, to the crisis of poverty uh, in the global south. I think that's, uh, that, that becomes a new imperative today. So consider then in this light um, another model that approaches African poverty and neoliberal globalization from an African perspective. And this I'm looking at the film Bamako um, by the, the uh, Malian director Abderrahman Sisako, who's a very interesting filmmaker. Um, the feature length film, I don't know if anyone's seen it in here, but it's, it's, it's worthwhile uh, taking a look at. Uh, it stages a political legal theater so the film is about this theatrical production uh, that takes place in uh, Bamako. In order to place the central financial institutions of globalization on trial uh, for the disastrous effect they've had on African economies and standards of living, subjecting its peoples to malnutrition, undernourishment, chronic illiteracy, unemployment, and to a lack of decent living conditions over the last few decades. The witnesses, including Ma uh, Mali's former culture uh, minister, um, who's Aminata Traore, this woman, this woman here, uh, come before the court one after the next to tell their stories, uh, mostly <coughs> recounted by the anonymous sufferers of the austerity budgets that are implemented by the World Bank and the IMF, the International Monetary <coughs> Fund, um, that they've forced on struggling African nations through so much blackmail and coercion. Uh, basically through debt servitude. So Africa is a rich 
Uh, Africa is rich in natural resources, she says, uh, yet has been exploit, exploited, brutalized, and impoverished. Um, she says, she continues and says, I am against the fact that Africa's main characteristic in the eyes of the world is its poverty. Africa is rather the victim of its wealth. That's what she says. This is, um, this is the clip, it just, it's, I couldn't get the subtitles in there, but she basically explains this in French. So just to give you a sense of uh, the film, I'll play it anyway. Le bon, je me lève en faux contre l'idée selon laquelle la principale caractéristique de l'Afrique est sa pauvreté. Elle est plutôt victime de ses richesses. Et je voudrais qu'on parle davantage de paupérisation, et non pas de pauvreté. Parce que quand vous parlez de paupérisation, vous touchez du doigt les mécanismes. Et Bush est au centre de ce mécanisme. Bush est chef d'orchestre. Donc je ne vois pas en quoi... En quoi et de quoi il se plaît Moi, je dis que l'Occident s'est créé et s'est infligé deux peurs le terrorisme et l'immigration. So what she says there is another interesting point. She says that she she doesn't like the term poverty. She prefers the term pauperization. Um, pauperization is a is a term you know to make someone a pauper is to make someone poor. Um, and she prefers that term because for her it points to the mechanisms, right? Instead of just using the noun, poverty, to point to the mechanisms is to point to the processes that make people poor. And she says, she goes on and says that Bush, the American president, is, the, is one of the major causes of pauperization. Um, so her, her point is further clarified by uh, other witnesses who identified the outlandish disproportion of debt repayments foisted on African nations, uh, repayments that typically take up nearly half of national budgets. So half of the national budget goes to debt service. Um, uh, and compare it to the less than 10% that they can spend on social programs such as education, healthcare, and infrastructure. So more than half of the nation's um, uh, income is spent on debt services. Less than 10% on education, healthcare, and infrastructure. That gives you a sense of you know, how these countries are, uh, it's an impossible upstream battle. So we theref therefore, we confront once again uh, the global paradigm in which poverty doesn't simply exist as such, as if it were uh, an accidental natural disaster, but is rather the result of neo-colonial financial pillaging of Africa by G8 nations. That's what becomes clear in this film. Uh, another interesting point is that Sisako was trained in, in Moscow during the 1980s. Uh, and as such, he was, he was one of the last in the line of filmmakers to participate in the revolutionary anti-colonial African cinema that stretches back to the 60s and 70s, when figures like uh, Usman Semben and uh, Sarah Maldivore took part in uh, skills exchanges in the Soviet Union. So I think that's a really interesting historical um, uh, uh, process that we don't know so much about or we don't hear that much about today, you know, how African Filmmakers were trained. This was part of the, the Soviet Union's struggle against um, uh, uh, African um, underdevelopment. Um, and that produced a, a radical filmmaking practice that uh, Sisako is one of the last to, to <coughs> exemplify. Although it appears as a vanished history in today's post Cold War context, uh, Sisako importantly makes a crucial stand against current forms of imperialism. And as such, he joins the ranks of other African artists and collectives who continue to struggle for political resistance and for a decolonization from corporate globalization and for practices that strengthen local communities, self-governance, and sovereign independence. Rather than perpetuate the image economy of African poverty, Bamako generates a community space of politicization directed against global financial arrangements, a space that animates local protest culture and activism against the World Bank and the IMF. Setting up a makeshift set in the midst of a domestic courtyard, the film interweaves legal testimony about the devastating effects of global financial instruments with scenes of featuring the diversity and vibrancy of, and the banality of Malian everyday life. So you have this, the, the courtroom scene is also the courtyard of a group of houses where people live. And you see images of everyday life. It, it's very strange, a little, a little surreal. But you see images of everyday life coming, uh, you know, right into the mise en scène of the courtroom drama. So the two, you know, everyday life and the legal 
this legal theater overlap in, in, in interesting ways. In other words, the film goes beyond the negative fatalism of media and artistic stereotypes that someone like the curator Okui and Wazer calls uh, Afro-pessimism. That is, you know, the way that Africans are typically depicted as uh, suffering poverty or malnutrition or violence or warfare. Um, in, in this regard, it's significant that Bamako has not only been screened in European film festivals, but has also been shown to local audiences. In this, for example, in the same courtyard where the film was shot, they, they set up a makeshift theater, which is part of, you know, kind of guerrilla filmmaking um, and film distribution that has happened in Africa, which is very interesting. That other filmmakers like Usman Semben have, have also done, you know. Um, so in other words, the film transcends the divisions between North and South and attempts to build political solidarity across those borders. These still emerging trade routes and communication networks, including the South-South axis uh, that, Muscara, that Gerardo Mascara calls attention to, uh, to and says that they need to be further developed, um, pose fresh possibilities for the circulation of imagery and information that can join transnational political alliances and artistic sharing across the growing geographical divisions of political, economic, and social inequality especially in the context of the ongoing right-wing movement of European and American political discourse and the widening gaps between North and South. It's crucial, I think, to develop these connections toward a transformative political project, one of social and economic justice, rather than allowing the forces of homogenization and economic inequality and anti-democracy to continue unchallenged. If Martins and, uh, and Alfredo Yar identify the barriers, Sisako points a way forward. At the end of Bamako's trial, um, the court aptly sentences, so the result of the legal trial is that is the court sentences the World Bank and the IMF to serve humanity for, perpetu for uh, perpetuity, for forever, uh, and in fidelity, to their original mandate, which is to foster long-term development and poverty reduction. Um, so they say this, even as one witness says, why waste your time? No one will listen. Thank you. <laughs>